So as I mentioned, this is my 29th book. This is not, however, the 29th book I've ever written. It's just the 29th in terms of the order they have been published. But of all my books, and the story of how they became published, the story behind The Curse of the Were Penguin is, I think, the most interesting. Because for a long time, I assumed The Curse of the Were Penguin was cursed. This was my first book, The Rodden Adventures of Zachary Ruthless. It was the first book I ever wrote. Not counting a few books I wrote in elementary school, but since those were only eight pages long, and half the pages were pictures, and they had construction paper covers, I'm not sure if they count. In 2009, I made a New Year's resolution to write a children's book. This is despite never having written a children's book before and having no idea how to write a children's book. But my young kids were reading them, and I thought many were quite good, so I wanted to try. I read books on how to write children's books. I went to presentations from published authors and instructors. I took a class. I joined the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, SCBWI, which is a wonderful organization. I joined a critique group, and then another one. And after doing this for six whole months, I wrote The Rodden Adventures of Zachary Ruthless. I know a lot of writers like to talk about how many rejections they had with their first book, how many years they spent trying, and they proudly relate. They had to beg for food and sacrifice a goat and do other things too horrible to mention in order to get published. Mine is not one of those stories. For this book, my very first book, had incredibly no rejections. That's right, the very first publisher who saw it, HarperCollins, bought it. And they bought three more Zachary Ruthless books, sight unseen, that I hadn't even written yet. So things were pretty good. The Rotten Adventures of Zachary Ruthless was a chapter book about the world's most evil fourth grader, his best friend Newt, and their plans to join the world's greatest collection of evil villains known as the Society of Utterly Rotten, Beastly, and Loathsome Law-Breaking Scoundrels, also known as Sourballs. Their headquarters is a giant blimp in the sky. It was a great book. Here was the sequel, The Stench of Goodness, and the third book, Sour Balls. Never heard of those books? Of course not. No one has. The first book sold three copies, maybe, and those were to my mom. And in fact, it sold terribly. The publisher never released the other two, even though they were completely illustrated. The fourth book, also, of the series was also written, but the publisher never bothered to have it illustrated, so all I have is a Word document of it on my computer. It's really interesting to look at as the covers. But the demise of this series, although upsetting and disappointing, because I think they were really good, wasn't so terribly awful at the time, because in the meantime I had written my very first novel, a book I called The Curse of the Were Penguin, which looked like this on my computer. It was a mashup of Dracula and werewolf movies, Mel Brooks-inspired humor, an orphan protagonist, a little bit of the Count of Monte Cristo was borrowed in there, and included an evil baron who wants to take over the world partly due to his love of fish sticks. I thought it was brilliant. It was hysterical, yet suspenseful. I was extremely proud of it. My agent at the time loved it too, and so she sent it out to publishers. I knew my first book was unique and that it had no rejections, and I didn't expect such continued fortune. I knew it was possible, maybe even likely, that a publisher might reject the book. Maybe two publishers, but it was far too brilliant and far too awesome for as many as three publishers to reject it, so I waited for the offers to roll in, and I waited some more, and a bit more cobwebs formed, I grew this beard, shaved it, and grew it again. My agent suggested that one of the reasons why no one wanted to buy the book was because of the disaster that was my first book. I had the scent of failure about me, just like dogs smell fear, publishers apparently can smell failure. My agent suggested that my career was probably over. This was not good news especially because being a writer was the only thing I'd ever really wanted to do ever since third grade, when I wrote my very first eight-page construction cover, heavily illustrated book, which was called The Big Cheese. I co-wrote The Big Cheese with another kid. His name was Hank, although I did most of the work. True story. In fourth grade, a year later, my teacher asked everyone in class what they wanted to be when they grew up. She put all of our answers into her newsletter, which she later passed back to us to give to our parents. I still have that newsletter. Most of the girls wanted to be teachers. 
Most of the boys wanted to be policemen or firemen, and a few wanted to be professional athletes. It was that era. A few kids wanted to be where their parents were, especially if their parents were doctors or business owners. I think one person wanted to be an astronaut. Roger Cook wanted to be a farmer because his family was parents were farmers. And I said I wanted to be a writer. I was the only kid who said that, by the way. Jump forward four decades later, thereabouts, to 2011, Alan, my agent, says to me, the terrible performance of your first book does not necessarily mean the end of your career as a writer. This is possibly the end of the career of Alan Woodrow as a writer. Plenty of writers use pen names, she explained. I could try that. So I made some revisions to The Curse of the Were Penguin to make it more sellable and put a pen name on it, Fowler DeWitt. Here's another true story. Seven years earlier, years before I made my New Year's resolution to write a children's book, my wife and I were driving to visit my parents in Michigan. I lived in Chicago, and it was about a four-hour drive. Not far enough away that I couldn't see my parents whenever I wanted to, but just far enough away that I didn't want to very often. As my wife and I drove, we passed a highway exit sign for two cities, Fowler, Michigan, and DeWitt, Michigan. Turn right, you hit Fowler, and turn left, and you hit DeWitt. I turned to my wife, who was in the passenger seat next to me, and said, Fowler DeWitt. That would make a great pen name. If I ever write a book and need a pen name, I'll use that. I had to write down that name, Fowler DeWitt, on a scrap piece of paper, and I forgot about it. Seven years later, when I needed a pen name, I found that scrap piece of paper buried in my basket where I keep random things like odd pieces of paper and old alkaline batteries. So we sent out the book, now emblazoned with Fowler DeWitt on the front, and we waited for all the offers to come in, and we waited, and we waited some more, and some more. Apparently my name wasn't the only part of the book the publishers didn't like. In the meantime, I wrote a different book called The Contagious Colors of Monthly Middle School, about the world's greatest sixth grade scientist who cures a horrible disease, which is somewhat topical, I suppose. And I put the name Fowler DeWitt on it, after all, because I assumed my career as Alan Woodrow was likely over. And Simon & Schuster, one of the world's largest publishing houses, decided to publish it. And they asked for a sequel before the first book was ever released. Here they are. And so, Fowler DeWitt became a household name. Well, not really. You've never heard of Fowler DeWitt before, before today at least. And the same three people who bought my Zachary Ruthless book bought The Contagious Colors of Monthly Middle School, and only two of those bought the sequel. This meant the, write, the writing career of Fowler DeWitt was looking just as short as the writing career of Alan Woodrow. But while Simon & Schuster was still getting excited about the contagious colors of monthly middle school, and before it didn't do so well, my agent got a call from another publisher, Scholastic. For a children's book author, Scholastic is the holy grail of publishers. I mean, everyone remembers buying books from their Scholastic order forms when they were in elementary school, or going to their school Scholastic book fairs. It turns out that the editors of Scholastic were big fans of my Zachary Ruthless book. Apparently my mom, my mom wasn't the only person to buy a copy. And they liked it so much, they wanted to publish a book by me, Alan Woodrow, with my name on it and everything. They didn't have a book at the time, so I sent them an outline for a book called The Pet War. It was about a boy who wants to adopt a dog, his sister wants to adopt a cat, mom's worried about affording a pet at all, so they have to have a, contest, a contest to earn money. Whoever earns the most money, the fastest, gets to pick which family, which pet the family gets to adopt. Scholastic loved it, and an amazing thing happened. Not only was it published, but more than three people bought it. A pretty decent amount did, and still do. In fact, many schools, schools all over the country use it for their one school, one book programs. So even while the contagious colors of monthly middle school was hitting the garage sale bins of the few houses that bought it, the pet war was saving my career. And so propelled by the success, I knew it was time to finally sell The Curse of the Were Penguin and put my name back on it. So that's what I did. After all, Alan Woodrow was finally making a name for himself. So I revised the book again. My agent sent it out again. And again, I waited for all the offers to come in. And again, I waited. And I waited. More cobwebs, more beard growing, than shaving, than growing again. But being a writer is about perseverance. It's about never saying never. Even when your agent tells you your career is over and your, after your first book fails miserably and your second one does too. So I wrote another book called Class Dismissed 
It's about a teacher who quits in the middle of the school year, and through a miscommunication, the school never finds out. The class decides to keep it a secret and see if they can get away without having any sort of teacher at all for the rest of the year. And this was that book. And this was the book that finally removed the unfortunate scent of failure that was Zachary Ruthless. It did even better than The Pet War, and the year was 2015. My name was becoming, if not exactly a household name, a name that some households had heard of. And I knew it was finally time to capitalize on that success and for the curse of the were penguin to fly even though penguins don't fly is a quirk of them. Yes, things were finally happening with my career. I want to stress a couple of things. This was not my third revision of The Curse of the Were Penguin. The truth, I'd returned to writing The Curse of the Were Penguin every month or two ever since it was first rejected. Even while writing The Pet War and class dismissed, I was making changes to The Curse of the Were Penguins. It became an obsession with me. There were dozens of versions. Some had twins being adopted by the evil Baron Cardata. Some featured a mysterious child living in the basement of the Baron's manor. Some were disturbingly creepy, others creepily disturbing. There's a bandit girl, Annika, who plays a pretty big role in the book, but she wasn't in the very first versions, but was born during one of these months. There's a strange religious cult that worships whales. That wasn't in the earlier versions either. Again, it was created during these myriad revisions. And I knew then... This was the time for the curse of the were penguin was finally going to sell. After all, as I mentioned earlier, great books get rejected all the time. I wasn't alone in this. Chicken Soup for the Soul was rejected 144 times. Emma Leonard's first book was rejected 84 times. James Patterson was, reject was rejected 31 times, which is not as much as Emma Leonard, but still a lot. Stephen King was rejected 30 times. John Grisham, 28 times. Dr. Seuss, 27 times. The Book of Wrinkle in Time. 26 times, the book catch 22, 22 times, which is sort of ironic, and so on. And so we sent it out again, and this time, surely the world would realize the wonderfulness of The Curse of the Were Penguin. It'd be one of those books mentioned when you Google book rejections, like I did, which is how I learned that Chicken Soup for the Soul was rejected 144 times, and so on. But again, nothing happened other than cobweb growing and beard growing and trimming that happened before. But I'm not the type to sit around wishing on a star, even though that's a good song. Scholastic was so happy with my books, they asked me to write a sequel to Class Dismissed called Unschooled. This book takes place in the same school as Class Dismissed, but with a different cast of characters. It's about kids competing during their school spirit week, but they get excited to win a mystery prize. So they were so excited that everyone starts cheating and friendships are compromised, secrets are blabbed, good sportsmanship abandoned. And then they asked me to write a third book in the series, which is called Field Trip. It won some awards. Both Unschooled and Field Trip sold a decent amount of copies. And at the same time, I began to write for the Cartoon Network, writing books based on their shows under a variety of other pen names. Publishers were also asking me to write books for classrooms, such as Leveled Readers, which I did, most of which I wrote under the name Follow DeWitt. I figured I had a pen handy pen name. I might as well use it. So here's just a smattering of those books. But in my heart, the one book I wanted published more than any other was The Curse of the Were Penguin. So I rewrote it and rewrote it again in between all these other books just like I had done before. I was way over 100 revisions of this book. Frankly, I'd written so many versions, I was totally confused about the whole thing. I couldn't remember what version was what, what characters remained and which I'd killed off and removed. I eliminated jokes, thought of them again, and then put them back in and then eliminated them again. But I couldn't stop. I, I was addicted to were penguins. But I stumbled through, and I told my agent this next version of The Curse of the Were Penguin was the best yet. Send it out. I feel like this is my moment. Finally, the world was ready. And my agent said, no. I needed to stop the silliness. She would not send it out. No one was going to buy it. I needed to stop thinking about penguins and move on with my career. In fact, she went one step further. She said we should stop working together. It was obvious my vision for my writing career no longer matched with her vision. But I think it was just really a nice way of her to saying that she could no longer work with someone who was so obsessed with queer penguins. And this agent had been with, through, with me through everything. Through selling my first book, encouraging me through my disasters, starting my relationships with the Cartoon Network and educational publishers. And it woke me up. It was the kick in the pants that I needed. And I decided that maybe she was right. It was time to abandon the curse of the were penguin forever. And so I did. And this was 2017. 
Life is funny. The Rotten Adventures of Zachary Ruthless was a failure, but without it, I wouldn't have a career, because Scholastic might never have found me. I became overconfident because of my immediate successes, but the curse of the were penguin brought me straight down to earth, and in the end, it cost me my agent. And life is funny in other ways, too, and this is one of those ways. Four weeks after that conversation with my agent, four weeks after being dumped by her, and finally putting the curse of the were penguin out of my mind, she sent me an email. Alan, I hope you are well. I'm reaching out because an editor at Viking Children's reached out to me about the curse of the were penguin, and she'd like to talk with you about it. Viking Children's, by the way, is a subsidiary of Penguin Random House, the largest publisher in the world. So I called the editor, of course, and the editor told me that she loved the book. She'd had it for a while. She'd kept it in her top desk drawer in her office, and she told me that over the years had looked at it over and over again, and it still made her laugh. And she asked, have you made any changes to it since then? And so I said, maybe. <laughs> what version of it do you have? It turns out she was among the very first group of editors who was sent The Curse of the Were Penguin back, way back in 2011. This is a senior editor who gets hundreds of manuscripts a week, thousands in a year, yet she had kept this manuscript in her desk drawer for nearly almost six years. She explained that she hadn't thought the timing was quite right for a book like this, but thought maybe now the timing was right. She was very interested in seeing any changes I might have made over the years, so I asked for a little bit of time. And I combed through those 100 other versions. I added bits and pieces of them to the version the editor had in her desk. This is that plucky grill bandit, Annika, and the cult of whales, and some of my favorite jokes. And then I waited. And I waited. And cobwebs started to grow again. And I shaved my beard and let it grow again. But then nine months after that, I finally got an offer, not just for one book, but for a trilogy of The Curse of the Were Penguin. The second cover was just completed a few weeks ago. Here it is, The Revenge of the Were Penguin. And the third book, of course, just looks like this on my word on my computer. I just like to, always like to end my talks with students with a little moral. And the moral here, I think, is pretty easy to figure out. Actually, there are two morals. The first moral is to find a pen name, just in case you ever need one. You never know. And the second one is not to never give up. Because frankly, I gave up. I Assume my crystal wear penguin was never going to happen. But it's never say never. Because even if you think something might never happen, don't despair, because life is strange. Just when you think it's going to zig one way, it zags another. And the fourth book you ever wrote becomes the 29th book you ever have published. And that's why life can feel pretty cursed sometimes, but can also be pretty amazing. Thank you very much. Do you have do you want to do questions? Sure. I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. So the version that she had, did it not have the girl character? It did not. Wow. So she must have liked your revisions. Uh, uh, yes. Obviously, because yes. the story we read had the girl character. And, I you mean, know, when she, when she called me, you know, when she emailed my, my former agent, um, she wasn't quite ready to make an offer yet. She was intrigued and wondered if I'd done anything to it. Um, and so you can look at my 99 versions I did since that first one is maybe a waste or maybe I never would have sold it if I hadn't had all those extra elements in it and hadn't spent so much time on it. And certainly she had ideas. Great editors bring something to the table. They bring their own ideas. They bring an, an outside influence. I, I readily admit that after my hundred versions, I was lost. I didn't really know what was funny anymore, what was not. I couldn't, I wasn't objective. So having an outside source coming in, looking at objective, I think really helped the book. So I think it's a much better book now than it was even then. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So where do you live now? I live in the Chicagoland area, still in a suburb of okay. Chicago. And what is your t-shirt study? Oh, it's uh, a... <laughs> Um, Teen Reads, it's a um, festival that's held in Texas every year, and I was, I was fortunate <laughs> enough to be a, uh, one of the authors attended a few years ago. And I like the t-shirt. <laughs> yes? So I think one of the really timely things about The Curse of the Weir Penguin is the, um, the conversation about families and how we make those connections and the, you know, the balance between the 
families that we're, we're born in and the families that we choose or that we create for ourselves and, and Bolt's uh, growth or learning process as he's searching for a family. And I think that's very timely right now. It, was that in the original version? Was that something that it, it's... That was always part of the, of the original version. So I, when I first decided, when I first landed on penguins, one of the reasons that I picked penguins is not only because they're kind of funny, Obviously, there's lots of funny goofiness with penguins, but they have one of the few animals where the mom and dad raise the chick. Um, so they really have a do strong sense of family. So I knew right away I wanted to tell a story of someone who was an orphan, was looking for a family, and so a penguin made a lot of sense as the animal because the penguin you know, has that family aspect to it. So you know, the, the feeling of, of being lost and feeling a part of the family was part of the original idea from, from the beginning. As a children's book author, one of the challenges uh, is you always want the kid to be the main protagonist. The kid has to solve the problem. So how do you get a kid without their parents having an influence? And having an orphan is, is a kind of an easy out, I guess you'd say, although uh, it blends itself well for this kind of book. Okay, well, thank you guys thank very much you. for, uh, yes, thank for your time. You.